Hey, everyone. Um, so I am Sebastian, and you can contact me on Twitter or whatever you like. I've been living in Singapore for about 10 years now, uh, doing my own little thing here now lately. I like JavaScript, open source, uh, open standards. And so I've been building stuff with all three of those. A couple of years ago, I started playing around with new protocols for the web, like HTTP2 and uh, Speedy, as it was then called. Um, a year later, that sort of evolved into implementing HTTP2 in JavaScript as an open source contribution to Node.js. Uh, another year onwards, and I've been using said contribution and implementation of Node.js HTTP2 to build a CDN, something that people can actually use in the real world. Uh, it has now grown to, well, actually, this slide might be a little outdated. This is from like maybe a month and a half ago. We had, you know, there's over 20 locations worldwide that are running as part of the CDN, an edge server. A CDN is something where you host websites, and you want a lot of locations to get low latency. Physical distance to a server translates into faster access times. So it's speed of light, but it's speed of light is not that fast as you think if you're going around the world. Um, the way that I'm achieving all these locations, there's, there's over 30 now, by the way. It's been eight months, I guess, so it's now over 30. Um, the way we, I'm achieving this is through these little guys, big picture, small box. I don't know if you can even see it at the back there, but this is essentially a Raspberry Pi plus an SSD. And when I say Raspberry Pi, I mean something similar priced and size and power consumption, but maybe five or 10x the performance in terms of CPU, networking, RAM, that kind of thing. Um, what it offers, uh, this Commons host thing, is right now static site hosting. So if you have a simple you know, sing single page app or PWA style, static files like CSS, HTML, JavaScript, images. You can upload it. You just run npx, commons host, CLI, deploy. Poof, it'll be available around the world on about 30 plus locations you know, automatically. There's really no limits or, or pricing on it right now. It's a very simple site, uh, site hosting service that I've just started, and I even, haven't even gotten around to building a pricing system. So don't worry about it. Um, this is kind of what you get. This is the best UI in the world. There's a, web, there's a website to it where it'll basically tell you to run this command instead, please. Uh, work, in, work in progress, some of the you know, polish required. It'll give you like custom domains, right, because that's free now. Thanks to Let's Encrypt project, you can get TLS certificates for your HTTPS stuff. Uh, it's you know, very easy to integrate that. You just point your domain to commons.host, that's all, and it works. Um, so no more struggles. Uh, it'll give you server push, which is really what I got into. Uh, as I said, I was like really excited about the protocol a couple years ago, and server push is a way to eliminate round trip times when you're loading a web page. So a little bit, my background is more like a web developer front end style, and I wanted to make my websites really fast. Rather than using something like Webpack to smush all these files together, I wanted to just, you know, at the protocol, more elegantly deliver every single asset in a single stream delivered by the server. That's what server push gives you. So I've got some tools that automate that, and it's all supported and beautiful. Um, so you make your website even faster than just being physically closer to your users. There's a bunch of documentation. Like I said, I've been here for about 10 years, um, originally from Belgium, and I came here via uh, Mumbai and Kuala Lumpur. Anyone from Mumbai or Kuala Lumpur? India or Malaysia? Anyone? Anyone? All right, yeah, massive crowds, nice. Uh, a lot of people there, though, I'll tell you, um, which is kind of what makes me want to do this. When I first came here, the interactive situation in Singapore itself was pretty abysmal. In fact, I had a co-founder on an open source startup that I was doing then, a different project, who left Singapore because the took, internet was just too slow. <laughs> <laughs> valid reason, right? I think we can all relate to that. Um, the main reason was that it was all DSL and cable, but also there was just no data centers on internet exchanges in Singapore, or just like not really many of them, and the few that were here were just kind of like poorly run and managed. That has all changed. At the time, though, if you were contacting any content, it was most likely hosted on a server in the United States or maybe in Europe, which either way gives you about 250 milliseconds of latency. Again, the round trip time around the world doesn't matter once you start crossing into intercontinental distances. Today, it's all glorious and beautiful and modern. And we have some of the cheapest um, fiber bandwidth in the world in Singapore. It's really nice. Uh, this is, does anyone use this one? What's it, what's it called? Like, I, don't, I, I didn't realize it's got this cheap, this Wizcoms. <laughs> it sounds weird, but okay, somebody should try it out. Um, we also have a lot of data centers and internet exchanges. This website is uh, 
called PeeringDB. This is basically uh, the Wikipedia of data centers. Like people just sort of self-report how much bandwidth they need and what connectivity they offer, just so that other network people can sort of you know hook up with them and you know connect the pipes and, and such things. Anyway, so it's showing that there's a lot of data centers in Singapore, and if you compare that with other cities, you'll see that there's like ridiculously more per capita. Um, Singapore is one of the best places in the world, at least especially in Asia. There's maybe three places uh, comparable, and it gives us an unrealistically fast internet connection, like locally. Something like one to two milliseconds round trip time to almost any CDN versus 250. That's a significant ad ad advancement in just less than 10 years. Um, the situation is not necessarily the same for everyone else. Most people in the world live in a circle. You've all seen these memes and stuff. Um, there's a, like one and a half times as many people on the right-hand side of the picture as on the left-hand side of the picture, and yet we are putting most of our internet infrastructure in the blue box on the top left, and the multicolor boxes on the top and, and, and in the middle there, and then in you know, Japan on the right-hand. There's, there's a lot of data centers in just a few places, and most of the people don't live there, and if you look at future growth of populations, it's definitely not there. Um, so that's, that doesn't make sense. But there's a bright thing that I've discovered by doing all this stuff. There's a lot of fiber to the, you know, whatever, uh, fiber to the home, especially, in Asia. Um, most of the fiber to home is in Asia, which is kind of shocking to me. And the, the reason is um, that a lot of the cities that, and the housing that people live in is just really kind of less than 10 years old. And when you're building something new, you're not going to put in copper, you know, copper wires and run DSL on it. You're just going to put in a fiber because that's the cheapest thing you get from Shenzhen. You just buy it in bulk and you roll it out. And it costs the same thing to roll it out, so you might as well put in something really fast. So, okay, we've got really good fiber now in all these new cities with massive amounts of people. Um, but we still don't have a lot of data centers and index exchanges because that's more like a business problem. There's a lot of sort of regulatory issues with like setting up a company in a lot of these countries and then doing business with other companies and like, monopolistic telcos and things like that exist in the world. Um, and that's still an issue. Um, and it sort of shows up by, you might have fiber in those cities and residential internet access locally might be cool, but between different countries, there's still like a lot of, I wouldn't say hostility, but just sort of lack of, lack of glass in the water. Um, if you look at like some of the, the top cities here, there, that's like Bangkok, uh, Ho Chi Minh, what is that, Yangon, Kuala Lumpur, Jakarta, Manila, yeah. Uh, these are like huge cities, lots of people. Um, disproportionately represented here, right? Um, but you'll see well, there's not a lot of cables going in and out of those cities versus the bottom three, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Tokyo, are like completely crazy, right? There's so much fiber. You can't put a new, you know, you can't put a fishing net in without cutting a fiber cut. But, and it doesn't even matter. You won't even, you won't even notice. It'll just offload. Um, so there's a really big difference. You know, a lot of times people talk about the internet as this like, ooh, sweet little, you know, a lot of, lot of uh, dots everywhere and they're all connected to, that's not true. The internet, connections throughout the world are very, very, very unequal. Like, if you have a dot in, let's, I mean, so many cities aren't even real. There's like a dot in Greenland, there's no way there's, there's like a big data center there. And it definitely wouldn't be as equally connected to everywhere else in the world as, let's say, like New York or something, or Alice Springs, apparently. Uh, no, this is nonsense. This is, this is, the internet is a concept, not a thing. It's a quote by somebody from another big CDN at an ITF meeting that I saw, and it's kind of cool. It's true, though. Um, the internet actually works through peering, which is like, you know, networks connecting to other networks. And so naturally networks will be of different sizes because like everything in the world tends to be of different sizes. And when you connect things of different sizes, you start having to negotiate, like what are the terms at which you connect to someone else? And that's why we have things like free and paid peering. If you're like a big, um, you know, if you have a lot of subscribers in a country or in a city and you have some small uh, new, you know, up and comer who wants to start their own little network and they've got like 100 subscribers and you've got a million subscribers, you're going to be like, dude, you're using all of my infrastructure, you're going to have to pay me. The other way around, maybe not. Maybe it'll be like, yeah, sure, I will, I'll, you know, we can have you access for free. And so this is a messy thing. Uh, the reason why we need peering is because if you're connected only to a couple of people, uh, you're going to have a hard time finding an optimal path, and that path may be congested. So if you want to send tra traffic from like, one city to another city around the world, you want to find as many paths as you can so that you can opt like, optimally use all this capacity. More peering more, this means lower latency, lower cost, uh, more bandwidth. Like I said, the, the, world, the world is not sort of homogeneously distributed in terms of capacity. Uh, bandwidth is a scarce resource, and you end up uh, with a lot of mess. And there's a lot of reasons for that, like I already explained. So one of the examples that I came across by deploying all these servers around the world is a city in, uh, called Udon Thani. Anyone been to northern Thailand? There's a small town there, you know, a friend of mine has a house there and he was like, yeah, I'll put, up one of these, uh, put up one of these servers in my house. Got a nice fiber connection there. 
And then I was like, you know, SSHing into that server and finding like, huh, why, is, why do I feel so laggy? Okay, turns out the routing from my small ISP in, in, in Singapore, uh, not one of the top three, um, was going via San Jose, California. So the traffic was coming from his server in Udon Thani to the Internet Exchange of Thailand in Bangkok, just outside Bangkok, then to Singapore with a really nice fast cable. But then it was suddenly going like 10,000 kilometers or something to San Jose, California, which is very inefficient, and then bouncing all the way back. Right? So th this doesn't make any sense. The reason was there was just no peering established between these two small ISPs. And they would fall back to another fallback that happened to be based in California. So like some big global company that has a big data center there. And, you know, via intermediaries, they would connect and exchange that traffic. There was no direct connection because the world just doesn't work that way. There isn't an infinite amount of connections. So with another ISP in Singapore, you might have a direct connection and traffic would be really fast. So it's important to have, um, if you're going to have caching servers, that you figure out where they are. And you want to be on as many ISPs in as many cities around the world to get low latency for everyone. Um, to do that, you normally would put your server at an internet exchange. Those are really big, fancy buildings with a lot of big, fancy servers that cost a lot of money which you know, none of these things I have or am. Um, and there's good reasons for that, but the traditional approach of putting a cache at every internet exchange really means the ideal approach is to put a cache at every ISP. And if you think about that, there's like a thousand or so cities that have over half a million people around the world. That's, more, that's the majority of the people in the world who live in these cities. If you wanna serve the majority of people in the world, to, or everyone to an approximate degree, you're dealing with about 60,000 potential uh, ISPs around the world, and you want to put about that many um, servers in that many lo locations. Uh, so that's kind of like the upper bound of my problem. Now, how I'm do going about that is finding like really cheap hardware and putting that at as many people's uh, houses and offices as are interested in the project and can afford to contribute a little bit of their resources to it. Uh, and for hosting, like what it actually offers as a service, like I said, is basically static sites because that's the simplest thing you could do with like, let's say a Raspberry Pi, you can saturate a gigabit connection. And again, that's like the upper bound of my, uh, you know, targeted economics for uh, every single location. Now, so in the six months we did 20 locations, in eight months we've done 30 locations now. I just checked this morning, uh, <laughs> which is pretty surprising. Uh, it's very easy to spin up a server. Some people actually just, like, I, I've been just, like, con con conversing with people through Twitter, and they're like, yeah, can, can I put one up in, you know, some random town? I'll be like, oh, I'll order it online, put it together. You know, I spray paint the covers really nice and put, like, a sticker on it. it looks, like, totally legit. Check, come check it out later. We've got, like, a little open source booth that we just hijacked a table outside there. Um, and I send it out. But other people have actually just gone and read the blog and seen like, what, what are the specs that are, okay, they'll just source it locally. Because, or they might already have a, uh, an SSD that, that, that they can re, you know, re recycle for, for this project. Uh, that also works. And I just, you know, they, you just ping me on Twitter, uh, I'll run my Ansible deployment and uh, you know, have a server in 20 minutes, a new location. And the routing is done automatically through DNS. It'll be a piece of cake. Um, the way this whole thing works is through JavaScript, fiber to home, and ARM. Uh, I've already covered JavaScript. It's awesome. You should use it. Uh, fiber to the home. It's everywhere, especially in Asia. Anyone recognize the place on the right? We all live in these kind of places. This is my former home. Um, to me, data centers or you know, data centers where you have a gigabit fiber connection or you know, HDBs where you have a gigabit fiber connection, kind of fungible. Uh, ARM is what's in your phones. It's like most of the chips in the world are ARM. Uh, they're basically like an alternative to Intel you could say they're kind of power efficient. This happened before, by the way, this new architecture stuff that came out. Uh, a company called Google 20 years ago, 21 years ago, I guess now, came up with this new little project. It's kind of nice. The cool thing about it to me was actually that the fact that they ran on this. This was their data center. This ran on Intel. And the cool thing was that they didn't care about like, having some million dollar server. They were like, yeah, we'll use these like thousand dollar servers. These normal computers that you have on your desk as We'll use that as our server. What I'm doing essentially is I'll take the computer that's in your pocket and we use it as a server. You know, 20 years later, there's enough performance in those things. You know, Moore's law and all that happened, died, but still happened. Um, so that's kind of like a parallel to it. Intel today is kind of expensive. You end up uh, paying a lot for these fancy Xeon servers, take a lot of power, whereas your ARM chips are like super cheap, especially the ones from like a year or two ago. <laughs> Oh, what was that? Ah, never mind. So, oh, ah, never mind. Come on, come on, come on, come on. We've seen this. The joke doesn't work again. 
So uh, what happens is a lot of these chips find their way like outside of your pockets and like leftover stock in factories. But if they make these like by the hundreds of millions or by the tens of millions, let's say, you know, even if there's like a few percent left over, that's like ridiculous volume. And people buy these things super cheap and build things like Raspberry Pis. That's why Raspberry Pis exist, is because these chips are sort of left over and they're like, you know, a few dollars. So people put these on these little boards. This is a, this actually computer is actually um, from a company in Korea called Odro called Hard Kernel, and the product is called Odroid, and they have different models. So essentially, what you have is a tiny little, I think it's like a Samsung Galaxy phone from a few years ago. The CPU is like on a tiny little board. That's like literally this is the entire board, and then this is just a random SSD, like a pretty nice one, but you know, still like any consumer grade SSD, right? And it works, um, and it costs like you know. A couple hundred bucks, and you can put them everywhere. So anyway, oh, you really, really good talk from. If you if you don't have your tickets yet for Foss Asia, there's a. I think there was somebody earlier announcing there's a discount code Geek Camp. You should totally go and attend. This is a really good conference. Last year, uh, Bunny Wang gave a talk, and he's like super inspirational um, about this phenomenon that you have all these leftover chips essentially, you know, in these little shops in China where they make these boards, or, or you know, I guess in Korea you might have the same. And some random little shop might have more chips than all of North, North America. It's like crazy. Uh, you, you know, everybody knows this now. I guess the market trends for you know servers and desktops is not doing that great. Mobile is doing really great. Projected a few four year, years forward, there's a kind of a saturation. I guess Tim Cook found that out um, recently. There's a lot of phone chips being sold, like ridiculously more than like let's say professional servers. This is millions of shipments per year. I think like two years ago or something. So one and a half billion versus 0.01 billion, um, I think. Uh, so guess where all the optimization in software is going to be? Guess where all of the investment into new technology is going to happen, right? Uh, there's a lot of them. So that's one of the things that uh, my project is built on. Oh, it's stupid animations, sorry. Uh, anyway, so these chips are not that bad. They actually can plenty, they have plenty grunt to saturate a gigabit connection if you're doing things like static site hosting, which is just copying buffers around in memory and shoving it into a network card and writing coding, uh, as well as DNS lookups. It's a very, very small amount of data required for that and very little bandwidth. So, which brings me back to these little servers. My goal is to have a massive CDN. Right now, the largest CDN that I could find is a couple, like, I think less than 2,000 locations worldwide. They have multiple servers at every location. But a couple of thousand locations isn't that great. Maybe maybe like a YouTube type of thing. Maybe it's like bigger. I don't know. Maybe a couple of companies are like bigger than that. But it's well, maybe like one company actually is bigger than that. I think. Um, but if the largest is a couple of thousand locations, I want to be in tens of thousands of locations. You can't do it with the same thing. But that's the goal. Uh, use a different kind of hardware and open source software to do that. Um, one of the other distincting factors is actually I don't own this hardware. None of the servers out there are owned by myself. And I think this might potentially be more of an important thing than the fact that it's open source. It's different when you have one company that has to follow one country's laws and then tries to deploy and enforce those laws around the world versus you have random people around the world owning the infrastructure, like physical ownership and control over the network is not centralized. And I don't mean in some kind of blockchain kind of way, right? I'm, I'm saying like, like you just, like if you buy this from me and you put it in your house, you can be part of the network and everyone benefits from that, but you own this and you can decide what to do with it. And you have to follow the laws of your country. Hang on, is this? <laughs> it's physically decentralizing. So I, I think this is a big, uh, big potential change in how CDNs are built. And there's a lot of implications in what it could mean uh, in terms of censorship, in terms of you know, uh, like a lot of the problems that happen with um, like internet services today. If they're very centralized and, and controlled by a, a few large companies that are fantastic companies, I have nothing against them. But the model fundamentally doesn't allow for something that will work worldwide. The world is complicated, and, and, and that's a good thing. People have different choices in different places. And the way to adapt to that, I think, is to build an entity that may be incorporated or something like that. But it still has to be able to adapt by having other people make those decisions, not a central control of, the, of, of that whole thing. Or at least like the open source model where you could fork off. You could take the code and you can take the hardware and reassociate. Like you can distance yourself from one central controller and reassociate with another group of people and build your own separate CDN that way. Um, that's something that is very hard to do with um, most traditional companies that are operating cloud infrastructure. Um, yeah, so I think a, a nice analogy would be open source projects. So anyway, 
this is kind of what it's running on right now. Um, well, this sort of low-end hardware that is at a certain point capable of achieving the desired outcome. Uh, it's, again, yeah, self-hosted. So one of the goals for this is to be financially self-sustaining. Right now, it's sort of myself and a couple of friends that are contributing their time to this. Um, in Singapore, everyone always asks me, so how are you going to make money? Um, I like that question. Um, not because I just want to make a lot of money. It's just like, how do you make it actually work? And what are the differences in making open source projects work when you're Mindset is based out of Singapore in the context of uh, Asia, let's say, um, that you don't necessarily have all you know, the government grants or, or the, you know, the private donor donations and stuff from, from, from like the United States or, or, or Europe even. Um, here you have to sort of you know, swim or drown, right? You have, to, you have to make something that's self-sustaining or it will just pass away and you better spend your time doing some other business. Um, I think a marketplace, which is really like what, this, what the traditional CDN has one side of, so if you're, if you're hosting your website, like I said, it's all free. You can host your personal website. That's fine. It's not going to take anyone's traffic that much. It's fine. It's too cheap to measure. But if you're one of the big websites out there and you're like trying to host a huge amount of video content, like, let's say you're like Michael Chang here and you're like, you got like terabytes of amazing content that like is streaming to everyone around the world every day because everyone wants to watch the recorded talks from Geek Camp and such. Um, you know, maybe Michael Chang's not... It's technically a business, but like, you're not like some big company. Let's say you want to build like the next big video streaming website, right? Um, most of the people contributing to Commons Host are probably quickly going to turn off their computer when they realize that it, their ISP complains and they're shutting down the connection. So what would work is if those people were getting incentivized to provide bandwidth and contribute resources to the, to the whole thing. And that's what kind of needs to be fit together. And like, you know, I haven't even got a nice website in place. I need help with that if anyone wants to uh, contribute. On, especially, on, especially on the design side, I'm like, you might have noticed I'm not the world's best designer. Um, but if we can figure out a way to sort of build a little marketplace around the Commons Host project, I think it could be a nice way to incentivize people to deploy way more of these rather than right now it's like really nice people who are contributing these things. Um, and it could scale like re really, really fast, really, really big. So that's kind of what I'm hoping for. So yeah, lately we've added this DNS over HTTPS service. Has anyone ever heard of that? That's basically a new protocol. So the idea with DNS is that your ISP actually sees all the queries that you're doing. And you're like, ah, oh, I don't want that because they're blocking certain sites that I like to visit. And then you switch over to like a Google public DNS or a Cloudflare public DNS. Like there's a couple of these providers. And these are like big companies. That's cool. Now they can, like, now you no, no longer get that censorship issue, but they now like know everything about you. And some of these companies might be selling your data or doing, you know, you don't know what they're doing. That's the fundamental issue. They might be great, and I know a lot of these people, and they're fantastic, but you just don't know. And so wouldn't it be great if you could run your own DNS server? And you can. Guess what? That's how DNS actually works. You just set up your own. You can have it on your own computer. That's fine. You have these like Raspberry Pi hole things that you can run at home. Like have a Raspberry Pi plugged into your network. You run a little distro on it. It's flash an SD card. It's super easy. The downside to that, then, is that you're now the only person using that server, and so that cache is always going to be you know, stale, and it means always have to make these slow lookups. And the solution to that could be something like you run your own, but you share with access to everyone else in your city, country, whatever. And so other people are now using your sort of decentrally owned uh, DNS hosting network and um, therefore keeping your DNS cache fresh. So it could be really fast, it could be really uh, you know, resistant to censorship and spying and all of that stuff. Um, and that's one of the ways I want to make this even simpler to host. I want to be able to uh, use even more low-end servers, like just pure Raspberry Pi, like a little single board computer, plug it in, and that could just run a Commons host distro on an SD card and be a DNS server for everyone. Um, so yeah, same benefits, like you want to have more and more and more of them. So we've got a couple of projects, and if you see a gentleman in the room here called Kenny Shen, he's one who uh, worked on this the most. Uh, we kind of collaborated on this for a couple of, for like a week-ish, and got it all done. That was pretty cool. Uh, the fact that we already had these networks, the, 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 all these servers out there, like 20 servers, we were thinking, like, what, what else do we do? So we came up with this idea called Play-Doh, playing around with uh, this DNS over HTTPS, uh, built like an overnight implementation of it, deployed it, and suddenly we have, like, I think, one of the top five uh, DNS resolvers, not by usage, obviously, but by locations around the world. So that was kind of nice. Uh, very easy to, actually, now it's even supported natively in Firefox and in the standard settings and stuff. You can just, you just, yeah, you just, all, all, that's all it takes to start using it. And you'll get like a bunch of servers in Singapore serving your traffic totally, you know, privacy 
available. Uh, next thing I want to do is, uh, with this is actually build a nice UI for it. Again, I could use some design help, but this could be a nice way to um, use this on any device. So you could, like right now, your software needs to specifically support DOH, and really only Firefox today kind of makes that, makes that possible. I want to make a proxy that just takes normal DNS, traditional DNS, locally, and then translates it into DOH, so that outbound it's super secure still. Right? So some ideas that I've been playing around with. Uh, we can do a lot of stuff to make it even more secure. And that would basically yeah, form like another tier of the network. So you'd have these enormously huge overpowered servers um, sarcasm, but you could have even yeah yeah you could have even lower end servers that are just plain Raspberry Pis uh, that you just you know literally plug in and forget. Uh, I could use some help with this. Um, just use it, right? If you're if you got a static site right now, a lot of people are uploading their their, their personal websites, just kind of like playing around with it. Uh, just publish it on there; it's free. And give me some feedback. Like if you have feature requests, I've just spent a couple of days implementing a bunch of new features like custom HTTP headers and redirects and all that kind of stuff. Let me know. I really appreciate that. Uh, if you want to host one of these things, especially if you're like not based in Singapore or you have your like family outside of the country or something like that, or you have a you work for a company that has other offices around the world, you know, let me know. And I would I have actually right now if you if you happen to be in uh, or have some friends or someone who can host this, I have a server in Jakarta. And I have a server in Bangalore. So in both cases, somebody funded it. The server finds itself there, and then it turned out that, for whatever reason, the person who was going to host it technically wasn't able to do it uh, for whatever reasons. If you can help me with that, that would be great. Uh, and if you can do this in any other locations around the world, let me know. Um, and if you have a couple hundred bucks lying around, and you're all highly paid developers, let me know. And you can, you can help contribute to this thing. And eventually, it'll be part of the marketplace, and you can probably make your money back. But I'm not promising anything. Uh, so and otherwise, just tell people about it, please. Thank you. Or, yeah. uh, I'm just curious how uh, if actually there are two, two questions, two different questions. Ooh. One is how would this uh, if I'm running a core network on this, what challenge would that take place on this CDN or that was like from a core network? So to clarify, are, are you using a Tor? Are you, are you a Tor user accessing the internet, and then you're cont contacting a site on this host? If it was, I mean, I, 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 you know, I'm just thinking about. So, it, like, to clarify, it's not actually running Tor or anything. You're not. You don't get to run your yeah, code so on the this, right? That are on that. Yes. 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 If they are going to be available on a Dock Onion network. On oh, no, a sorry. Dock Onion. Uh, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, maybe. So the, the, the dot onion thing, if I understand it correctly, and I'm I'm not like that experienced with with Tor and, and you know, um, that applies to sites that are hosted on Tor, and so you're accessing that from outside, and there's like exit nodes that because basically provide those. Exit nodes are because your address is resolved on the, on the onion network, so dot okay. onion uh, okay. will be resolved to a different IP number okay. through the to a different DNS resolution. Okay. Uh, not your Sure, sure, sure. But principle remains the same. So it just—it's a traffic issue, and I'm not sure how else to to measure it. Hmm. So I, I'm okay. afraid I don't have an answer for it. What was your second question? What's the second question? Maybe none. Oh, IPFS. Ah, oh, yeah. So everyone keeps asking me about this. The way I think about that is, in the very near future, I want to implement sort of IPFS as a potential backend. So right now, actually. Your backend is just is, is my S3 bucket, and you upload your site. I put it on S3, and the cache is just sort of you know proxy that content, right? Um, that's not nice because I I pay for that S3 bucket, <laughs> which is which is nice I guess to others, but not so much to me. It's not really scalable. Um, I would like other people to choose their backend. Like you can bring your own backend. Like you, you can have your own server where you host. Like Michael could host all of his you know engineers G videos, or he can say like, hey, they're on this S3 bucket. Can you just proxy that for me? Right. So. One of those options could be not just like oh, I have my own web server, I have my own S3 bucket. I could have my own like IPFS node or something or address that I want to proxy. So I think that's uh, uh, something that I'll be working on in the next couple of months. Yeah, Stephanie, any more time? Uh, any more questions? Bastion. We're good. Well, we don't have enough time for the next. I'll, I'll be outside if you want to ask me more questions. Yeah. Okay. So, can be outside. Thanks.